Hello, a very warm welcome, dear friends, dear colleagues from the HPP, dear colleagues from outside the HPP. It's my particular pleasure to welcome you to the Human Brain Summit 2021. The Human Brain Project is a large project that started in 2018. It's one of the largest, it's also one of the projects with the longest uh, time horizon. And when it was decided to support this project, I think this was courageous, but it was also the right decision at the right time. Why courageous? Because at that time, neuroscience was very often fragmented. There are many disciplines, even many communities. And when you think about that this is a future and emerging technology project, it was also not straightforward to fund a project that has such a strong component in basic neuroscience. But why it was timely? Well, because we had uh, the situation that increasing power of computing, of technology allowed to address something that is so complex as a human brain. And there was, of course, a need because there were, there was, uh, it was, has been seen by politicians, by stakeholders, that the burden of brain diseases is extremely uh, important for our society and is growing in the next, in the next years. Finally, digitalization uh, started and it was clear that it will change the society and the industry. So based on these considerations, the HPP started and it started with a combination of mouse brain research, human brain research, cognitive research, but also theory. And in order to support these sciences, uh, we saw from the very beginning that we need new neuroinformatics tools and new tools for modeling and simulation. And modeling and simulation very quickly are very demanding in terms of compute power and resources. So there was a project for high performance computing and analytics. And the idea was then uh, to also have a medical informatics platform uh, to use these tools to come up with biologically more uh, founded classification schemes. And from the very beginning, also neuroscience benefited from collaboration with medicine because the diseased brain is informing the healthy human brain and we learn from it a lot. And last but not least, uh, we also from the beginning thought that in addition to uh, high performance computing, there are other ways of computing like neuromorphic computing, which are inspired by the brain and which help us uh, not only to develop new technologies, but also to better understand the mechanism of signal transduction. And um, the human brain, of course, is also not acting as an organ uh, as itself, it has a body. And this is the approach uh, that we see in neurobotics. Last but not least, the HPP was one of the first projects worldwide that has a very strong emphasis on ethics and society. So where we are now, eight years later, we have decided to focus on three topics that are interrelated to each other, on connectivity, on the way how this connectivity enables cognitive function and consciousness at the end, and what is the relationship and the meaning of these networks for disease like uh, consciousness diseases or coma, for example, and how can we understand natural neuronal networks by developing artificial neuronal networks. And again, this has a consequence uh, when we think about AI developments, which goes far beyond uh, human brain research. So how to, how to do it? Well, it was clear that we need a lot of methods and tools, but we did not want to have just a collection of tools. We wanted to combine them, integrate them into a platform. And how this can be done in a co-design process based on use cases. Use cases, these are very concrete neuroscientific questions which require in the HPP the interaction of different disciplines and require a certain technological basis. And this is what we have developed with eBrains. And you have eBrains now available. It's accessible through the website and you can uh, access the tools 
and uh, develop your own research topics based on these tools um, and based on the data that we have collected during the last uh, eight years. And we feel now that is also the right time point to even more open and up. And also the platform is not yet finished. It's not everything polished and, and ready, but it's functioning. And it's important that you are now using it more and more. Give us also feedback, help to further develop it and uh, make it ready for, for the next years. And we were very pleased and very happy to see that last year we were successful in uh, becoming partner in the S3 roadmap which makes our infrastructure, eBrains, a sustainable infrastructure. So it can be used in the, in the next years and we can develop it, it together. To open it up also means to open up the summit and to have more guests, uh, not only from inside, but also from outside the HPP. And uh, we have about 570 registrations. Uh, 150 of them are students and of these 150, 100 are from outside. So that's really great. I'm happy to see that you're curious and would like to understand uh, what happens here. And you see it in many different sessions, like for example, in the, in the parallel sessions where you can go into a dialogue with the developers and learn more about the different tools that we are developing. Or we have have uh, HPP in action, a very interesting session where we show uh, with a couple of examples how you could use perhaps in your own research the tools and, uh, and services that we have developed. And uh, we will give some examples to you that you can also then follow up uh, in the science market uh, that, uh, that is open later this afternoon. What, what does it mean to address uh, research? Well, there are many, many questions, of course, you, you can ask. But what eBrains makes different in comparison to other approaches uh, that are there is that you really can connect different elements, that you can use uh, a theory and build a model out of it, take data from our platform or use the atlas in order to orient yourself. Then you can run simulations crossing the scales from the molecular scale uh, to the large scale. And such approaches are needed and are necessary. And one example is uh, the situation that we have with COVID now. And we see that several tools that we are developing are quite helpful in order to address uh, the burden uh, that our societies are facing uh, with respect uh, to, to changes uh, in, in our uh, well-being and in our behavior and modeling and simulation also here play an in increasing role so it's a very the hbp is a very ambitious project of course and uh, we are grateful to our funders but also to our stakeholders uh, that helped us to um, to go through these uh, past eight years and also to continue. And sometimes even large flagship projects have very bumpy roads. And, and it was great, good to see that we had a lot of support. And uh, one of the supporters uh, of the Human Brain Project is uh, our Science and Advisory Board. And you will see uh, some of the representatives in, in the next day's program. We have also now uh, invited lead scientists, and you will see some of them in the next um, in the next sessions. And when you are listening to the keynote lectures, then please ask questions because the keynote lectures are 25 minutes, and five minutes are for Q and A. So please put them into the chat. So I hope that we have put together an exciting program for you, that you will learn a lot, that you can participate in our endeavor. Please don't hesitate to contact us for questions, for new ideas, uh, and uh, communicate with us, discuss with us what are the right ways. And saying that, uh, I would like now to hand over uh, to one of the stakeholders that supported us for a very long time, that is Professor André Surota, himself a very well-known and uh, very famous neuroscientist and also the chair of our stakeholder board and board of directors. So, André, I'm extremely happy that I can now give the word to you to welcome uh, our uh, colleagues to the summit. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you all, dear colleagues. 
It's my great pleasure to open the scientific part of this year's HVP Summit alongside Catherine. Eight years ago, the HVP set out on a journey of discovery. Although our objectives have evol evolved from the original goal to model the whole human brain, I believe that you have achieved major impactful results and gained essential insights towards a better understanding of brain complexity. Most importantly, you have achieved what I believe to be one of the ultimate desirable outcomes for such an endeavor. That means building together the foundations of an enduring infrastructure that will serve for the years to come generations of brain scientists, that is the brains. I follow closely the impressive work of the HBP scientific teams. Your progress on the key scientific areas that HBP tackles have already led to major breakthroughs and I'm very excited to progressively discover the final results in the next 18 months. As we are gently coming closer to this incredible 10 year endeavor. You know as well as I do that the next set of HBP deliverables will be vital important for, vitally important for its success. Your role in communicating HBP science to the wider communities and informed public is critical. As you are not only part of the scientific communities, but also HBP and eBrain's best ambassadors towards your peers, funding agencies, and society. It's critical that the research communities at large benefit from your results from the tools, services, models that you have created. It's vital that we invite new researchers and new institutions from various new fields and disciplines and that they feel empowered to collaborate and contribute to this joint effort. This openness is key to achieving the outcomes that we have set our sights on, are committed to deliver. In order to leverage the potential of the eBrain's research infrastructure, to broaden the scope of our ambitions, striving for the impactful future that brain research should contribute to build, it's time that we reach out widely and far beyond the HBP consortium, the scientific domain that you represent. Not only is it your role to demonstrate that e-brains can unlock and the avenues it can open for scientists, but it's also your mission to involve them and to identify their needs. The brain's research infrastructure must become the go-to enabling platform that will allow scientists to tackle the key technical, scientific, and societal brain-related questions and challenges. The brains will also face another challenge. As the HBP grant will end in about 18 months, the brains needs to become sustainable and to create the ecosystem that allows for its development operation and growth. It's, I believe, one of our best chances to ensure that science and brain, and brain research in particular remains at the core of society. As Catherine said, last July, we succeeded, including eBrains, on the S3 roadmap. Through this vital milestone, eBrains has joined the list of Europe's top science facilities eligible for state funding and has gained access to the different research ministries in the EU states. The European Commission also expects a far-reaching white paper highlighting some of your most impactful results and achievements and where you will describe your strategic vision of how the science should evolve 
from this on a project to one on a global European distributed research infrastructure. We must now convince the states that eBrain's prime goal is to serve the research community needs and that investing in this research infrastructure is critical to allow it to grow sustainably. The emerging national nodes have already started this process in the so-called S3 preparation phase. Securing national funding will allow the nodes to offer their services to the communities who will be able to reap benefits from all the work that you have done in the past eight years and leverage the funding and trust that the EU has invested so far. As you can see, the pieces of this fascinating and promising puzzle are getting into place and I was really keen on sharing those perspectives with you, especially since you are at the center of this endeavor. For the time being, I would like to congratulate you for your inspiring work and let's, let's make the HBP a great success by putting the finishing touches to the rights services, demonstrating their potential to lead to new discoveries and reaching out all the highly skilled and motivated scientists. Talking about impacting tools and accomplished scientists, it's now my utmost honor to introduce our keynote speaker. To only highlight one of his many contributions to neuroscience, you may know him as one of the brains behind SPM, the statistical parametric mapping software, and VPM, the voxel-based morphometry that, that are used universally to look for correspondence to, in brain activity as measured by PET and MRI. We actually use the SPM and VPM in my lab at Orsay when I was still working uh, to PET imaging in small connection with my friend Richard Frakoviak at the FIL and then Carl became scientific director of this Welcome Trust Center for Neuroimaging. Professor Alfred Stone received the first Young Investigator Award in Human Brain Mapping in 1996. Ten years later, he was awarded the Minerva Golden Brain Award. And most importantly, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society. Among other prizes, he was awarded the Charles Branch Award for Unparalleled Breakthroughs in Brain Research and the Glass Brain Award in 1916. He joined the HBP as lead scientist with a project on disconnection syndromes and dynamic causal modeling. He is the author of one of the most impactful and cited articles in neuroscience. Carl, welcome and thank you for being here today. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here uh, and to speak to you. Um, I'm going to pick up on exactly those three themes that um, we've been rehearsing, the notion of connectivity, disorders of consciousness, and the potential importance of simulation and modeling. Uh, and I'm going to do that by overviewing for you three of my favorite themes, uh, each of which contextualizes the next, um, that will lead a path to the particular project um, that we um, that we will hopefully prosecute, um, or I will uh, prosecute with Richard Roche as a, as a lead scientist. Now, this is going to be a breathless presentation because we're going to do three uh, uh, important areas of neuroscience from my perspective. Um, 
so forgive me i've also tried to make it sort of conceptually entertaining just to cover things in a coarse grained way um, that will hopefully engage people who are not so intimate with some of the details um, so i would be grateful if someone would tell me when i've got five minutes well, after 20 minutes of talking because i do tend to, to talk uh, quite a lot so the um the basic idea here is that synaptic disconnections underwrite psychopathology so this is the connection between the connectome or connectivity in the brain and the um, disorders of consciousness of the sort that characterize and i'm going to um, focus on schizophrenia in the first instance but actually use epilepsy um, as the probably the best worked example of this kind of uh, disconnection i'm going to move from a consideration of psychopathology in terms of disconnections and synaptopathies um, to the theoretical basis um, that suggests where the pathology might be and consider very briefly active inference and predictive coding and crucially the key role of precision and then finally turn to the more practical issue of how you use simulations and modeling to harness empirical data to ask questions about the particular kind of synaptopathy um, that we are led to from these more theoretical um, considerations so the basic idea here is that all of our consciousness in fact everything that we think and do can be construed as a form of inference whether it's in perceptual inference or synthesis in inferring what's out there causing my sensations or whether it's inference about what i'm going to do next either a very subpersonal level in terms of movement or planning as in decision making so if it's the case that all action and perception is inference then it follows that the pathology of psychology or psychopathology must uh, correspond to false inference and i mean that in a very simple sense in the sense that um, a statistician might make a false inference and infer something was there when it was not or infer something was there when it wasn't and i'm going to read those kinds of failures as a, a mathematical metaphor for things like hallucinations and delusions inferring something is there when it's not or neglect syndromes and agnosias inferring something is not there when it is but we want to really understand the particular failure of inference in terms of neurophysiology um, and the line or the story i'm going to pursue is that false inference reflects a failure to encode the uncertainty or the predictability or mathematically the precision of our beliefs as our brain does its inference by belief updating so computationally from the point of view of say predictive processing um, the story here is that we some conditions are characterized by an aberrant encoding of uncertainty or precision in computational terms and from a physiological point of view this is reflected in a failure to modulate the synaptic efficacy responsible for passing messages that do the belief updating in a connected brain um, the best way i think to um, motivate that particular account um, comes from psychiatry although the arguments can also be applied to um, neurology i'm going to take schizophrenia as a sort of um, poster child of this kind of failure of um, inference and just briefly review the symptoms and signs of psychosis so on the left hand side here i've got all the positive symptoms delusions hallucinations thought disorder and on the right hand side we have the signs psychometric poverty soft neurological signs such as abnormal mismatch negative and abnormal eye movements the the point that this sort of um, very coarse grain taxonomy um, of schizophrenia or psychosis in general makes is that all the symptoms or all the abnormalities of consciousness can all be construed in terms of abnormal beliefs that must ensue from some failure of inferring what's going on or what i am doing and indeed if one thinks about it nearly every neurological or psychiatric condition can be construed in that fashion ranging from um, failures to infer what kind of body i have in dysmorphophobia right through to persecutory beliefs in delusional systems all of them 
speaking to what a subject experiences in terms of her beliefs about um, her lived world. On a sort of physiological view, I've listed here a lot of the, or some of the key synaptic and um, pathophysiological uh, theories of the causes of psychosis, um, focusing on things like the dopamine hypothesis and aberrant plasticity and salience, glutamatergic hypotheses that focus very much on MDA receptor function and all its attendant um, failures in terms of abnormalities in terms of fast synchronous uh, um, interactions, GABAergic hypotheses, very important in relation to the role of inhibitory neurons in um, mo mediating cortical gain control, excitation, inhibition, balance, and how that sets the scene for abnormal message passing and synchronized activity in the brain. Um, on the right-hand side, some of the more etiological perspectives afforded by genetic or neurodevelopmental uh, stories and the mechanistic um, uh, contributions of psychopharmacology and also the encultured psychosocial and possibly also immune etiological factors. Again, coming back to the synaptic hypotheses, what does this tell us? Well, all of these synaptic mechanisms speak to a failure of neuromodulation. So not in the passage of information from one neuron or population to another, but the way that it is contextualized and how sensitive one neuron is to the messages it receives from others. And this leads to um, a notion of disconnection in the context of connect, uh, the connected brain um, that could be read in one of two ways. And I'm um, cartooning that here in terms of um, two great ideas, but slightly um, that distinguish themselves but in virtue of the different emphasis that is put upon anatomical connections, the disruption of the organs, the white matter organs of connectivity um, of the sort implied by Wernicke's subjunction hypothesis. And I've illustrated that with a sort of cut through the wires on a circuit uh, board here, as opposed to a more pernicious and subtle um, disconnection or, or, or um, a dysfunctional uh, connectivity that one could imagine would be caused by a failure of transistors, which is much more this neuromodulatory um, kind of disconnection, which I'm going to read as a synaptopathy, but a particular kind of synaptopathy. And I'm selling that perspective as a, um, uh, um, a, a realization of this disintegration of the psyche that um, Bloiler um, um, described so um, eloquently uh, you know, at the inception of the notion of, um, of, of the split brain as a, or, uh, or uh, schizophrenia. So that's the basic setting. Um, what I want to do now is say, well, why would it be so important to get the synaptic efficacy and the modulation of that synaptic efficacy right if um, the brain can be thought of as an organ of inference? Um, so this part of the story is um, more theoretical and it's asking the question, you know, how does the brain work? How do you get consciousness from connections? And the idea in predictive processing, uh, specifically active inference, um, is that the brain is literally a fantastic organ. It is an organ that is constructing hypotheses, fantasies, explanations for the sensorium. And I think this is nicely illustrated by um, this um, 16th century oil painter famed for painting still lives that when viewed from another direction give you a very different explanation or perceptual hypothesis for what might have caused this uh, particular pattern of sensory inputs. So if previously you saw a bowl of fruit and yet now you see a face, the key thing is that you made that face. This is an active, constructive, perceptual uh, process by which you bring a face to the table as an explanation to best explain these particular inputs. So again, this notion that the brain is a constructive statistical organ actively predicting and inferring what's going on out there to produce these sensory impressions. And I use the word sensory impressions because that's uh, taken from um, 
many of the writings of Helmholtz, who I think was the, uh, the you know, best articulated these ideas. So for example, objects are always imagined as being present in the field of vision, as would have to be there in order to produce the same impression on the nervous mechanism. Again, speaking to the fact it has to be on the inside. So perception and belief updating is very much an inside out process. It's not an outside in extracting information from the sensory input. It's really trying to explain the sensory input. And this, of course, is very close to subsequent ideas in psychology for example, perception as a hypothesis testing uh, from Richard Gregory, and indeed ideas that have been leveraged and developed with enormous power in machine learning and statistics. And I'm, I'm thinking here um, of the work of people like Jeffrey Hinton and Peter Diane on the Helmholtz machine and the Bayesian brain. Um, borrowing from Thomas Bayes and Bayesian theory and the work of uh, Richard Feynman. So, how does it work? So let's come back to this notion of uh, sensory impressions. Um, if it's the case that one has to infer the causes of impressions, one's left with the challenge of inferring, for example, the shadows uh, projected onto our sensory veil. So here I've cartooned that in terms of some possibly leaves or whatever being projected onto our sensory epithelia and then we have to make sense of that data through a process of predictive uh, uh, a predictive process so how might that be done um, most formulations over the past uh, few years or decades um, call upon some form of bayesian filtering or predictive coding and it's very simple um, uh, the form of this belief updating will be quite crucial to this precision story. Um, so I'm just writing this down mathematically in terms of some expectations, mu, that change in proportion to how much we might predict the changes in some sensory input, given our understanding of their causes, our expected causes, mu. And then they are updated by some precision pi weighted prediction error. So what is prediction error? Well, imagine we had this sensory impression on our sensory epithelia and that we had some expectation encoded by neural activity that the cause of this sensory pattern was a howling dog. And if we had a generative model G, then we could generate what we would have seen if we were correct, and then we can subtract that from what we are actually seeing the sensations S. And the difference, the mismatch between the sensory input and the predictions is just the prediction error. And all this equation says is that these prediction errors drive the expectations so that the prediction errors are self-cancelling, so that we can minimise the prediction error and therefore um, commit to a, an explanation for the causes of our sensations in virtue, which is good enough in virtue of the fact that there are no prediction errors. Now notice this is not saying that we'll, we will ever find the true causes of our sensations. In fact, in this particular instance, the true cause of the sensation was a cat, not a dog. But that doesn't matter. If you can get through life keeping your prediction errors minimal, um, then job done, that's fine. So this notion of minimizing prediction errors, which is a very generic notion, um, and provides a very nice perspective that subsumes action and perception because there are two ways that we can minimize prediction errors. We can either change our brain states, our neural activity, our efficacy, our connectivity to best uh, to make the predictions more like the sensations and we can think of that in terms of perception and learning or we can simply change the sensations by sampling the world, by acting upon the world in such a way that we bring the sensations closer to the predictions. And we can see this as an elemental way of formulating action, that we sample the world to make our predictions and preferences and expectations come true. Um, and I'll just illustrate that um, with a, a particular example. This is not um, a human brain, it's a, a bird brain, but um, usefully illustrates 
um, the importance of minimizing prediction errors in terms of authoring your own sensations, basically acting upon the world um, to produce the kind of sensations you expected to see. And crucially, how that depends very, very sensitively on this key um, factor or um, um, on this precision, which is responsible for setting or controlling or modulating the influence of the prediction errors on our expectations, on our belief updating. So that if we deem or if we estimate or predict that a certain kind of prediction error is very unpredictable, it's very imprecise, we have very low confidence in the quality of information conveying, then this will be downweighted and it will have much less influence or impact on our belief updating. Conversely, if we are convinced that this source of prediction error has a very high precision, then we will effectively attend to that source of information, that newsworthy information that just is a prediction error, the information that has yet to be explained, um, and then this prediction error will have a big influence. So imagine this sort of little um, bird brain uh, small cortical hierarchy, and we're in a mode where we've used our positions, the precisions, um, to switch on or attend to or increase the gain of sensory auditory information to the auditory thalamus here. Uh, in the absence of any predictions, all the information is predictionary, it goes up, it revises our expectations and so on hierarchically, so that we have minimized prediction errors at several levels of abstraction. Um, and then that gives us better predictions that come down and cancel the prediction errors um, so that we can explain them away and um, arrive at an expectation that has that minimizes the prediction errors. But all of this perceptual synthesis, this predictive coding um, in the context of listening, um, also can be used to generate what I would have had to do with my voice muscles in order to produce this kind of song. But when I'm listening, I can basically switch off the prediction errors that would normally be used to drive the musculature to provide the predicted signals to suppress the proprioceptive prediction errors. So all I've described here is a classical reflex arc that's doing the prediction error minimization um, through action in a very, very simple way. But if I now were to switch the precision from here to here, I get a very different picture where now I am using exactly the same machinery to drive predictions of proprioception that are realized reflexively that will actually generate the sound that I expect to hear. So what we have is a sort of um, a yin yang between listening and singing that can be leverage simply by adjusting the precision um, and that I am using to illustrate the real importance of getting the, the modulation of the precision of the synaptic gain the uh, efficacy of um, the message passing of prediction errors right in terms of an active synthesis perceptual synthesis or inference about our world um, we can unpack this in terms of sensory attenuation, the predictions of precision in terms of attenuation and sensory attenuation. I just wanted to illustrate, um, if we had time, the, the real power of this um, attenuation of the precision of sensory information when we are moving, when we're directing the precision to the active side of our active inference. And I'm going to use saccadic suppression just to illustrate that so um i would normally do this interactively but i can't do that at the moment so i'm going to have to um, rely upon your participation covertly if you are um, a man um, i'm going to ask you to do one kind of task and if you're a woman i want you to do another kind of task but both men and women have to tell me or work out for themselves whether this picture of sherlock holmes changes and what's going to happen in a second is that Sherlock Holmes is going to jump from this side of the screen to that side of the screen and the idea is I want you to see if you can identify any change in the configuration or the color of Sherlock Holmes in transit from here to here.
Now, if you're a man, what I would like you to do is to keep focus on and visually track Sherlock Holmes. If you're a woman, I would like you to fixate on the central fixation cross. So, but both of your tasks are exactly the same, but the difference is the men will be tracking and the women will not be tracking. So I'm going to count down and then um, I'm going to um, ask you to think about whether anything changed. So three, two, one. Now, I won't ask anybody, um, but my hope is that if I did ask somebody, if I asked a man, they would say, no, I didn't actually see very much change. There was something going on, um, but I couldn't, I couldn't actually identify any change. If I asked a woman, I can uh, guarantee there will be somebody in the audience who said, well, hang on, there was something that actually occurred around the fixation point here. And some, um, uh, and some people can actually see very acutely exactly what uh, happened here. Basically, did you miss me? Now, the men would have missed me. And that's because they were moving. And while they were moving, they were attenuating the precision of, this, of their extraceptive visual prediction errors. So this is a really powerful example of saccadic uh, suppression or attenuation of the precision of sensory prediction errors at, at a time scale which is incredibly fast and really hardwired. You cannot consciously um, intervene on this kind of modulation of precision. This phenomena not only acts in terms of um, enabling action and visual or other um, sensory sampling of the world, it's absolutely crucial in the hierarchical construction of percepts. So again, very briefly, let me try and illustrate that in terms of, um, in the next slide, you know, another little sort of online experiment. Before doing so, we now have this, this sort of um, framework within which we can think about now how a failure of that kind of saccadic suppression or sensory attenuation might be a, a plausible candidate to explain many of the symptoms and signs in schizophrenia and the false inference we were talking about. So a failure, a neuromodulatory failure of sensory attenuation will basically force you attend to the details of the sensorium in the absence of any high level constructs. You, you are basically ignoring your prior beliefs leading to possibly agnosias, attenuation of violation responses, psychomotor poverty, and crucially things, resistance to illusions that depend upon prior beliefs. And if we have tried to compensate by increasing the precision of higher message passing, then we might have an explanation for false inferences that are basically ignoring sensory inference, the type one errors that we were talking about before, such as hallucinations and delusions. And, and we all do this sort of adjustment of the precision of prior beliefs versus sensory evidence all the time. So imagine um, I gave you um, this um, sensory stimulus and I asked you, you, what's your best hypothesis, best guess at the causes? Is this a pile of pebbles or a pile of coins? And you will be attending to this, um, um, augmenting the precision of the sensory evidence at lower levels of the hierarchy. But if I now give you some a precise prior belief about the cause of that particular pattern of sensory input, I'm now endowing you with a more precise explanation, which now will override some of your more attentive sensory expectations. And it won't go away, even if I reinstate the original stimulus, you now cannot not perceive the, the face. So I've changed only the effectively the precision or the gain in your hierarchical uh, hierarchical inference. So I'm now taking that notion that it may be that the etiology at the level of message passing that leads to uh, d um, disorders of consciousness or certainly conscious um, subconscious inference is a synaptopathy, but a very particular kind of synaptopathy. It's the kind of synaptopathy that rests upon a failure to modulate synaptic efficacy. So very briefly, how can we get at that using uh, things like e-brains and uh, modeling and simulation? Um, my, our approach will be to use something called dynamic causal modeling. Um, in brief, we're not going to be looking initially at schizophrenia, 
Um, oh, thank you. I've got I've got um, I've got a five minute warning. Excellent. Um, uh, we're, we're actually going to go to um, a, a domain which is uh, equally important from a clinical perspective, but probably better worked out in terms of uh, abnormality of the synaptic message passing, which is epilepsy. So um, we're going to focus on hopefully um, the abnormal fluctuations in synaptic efficacy um, that attend seizure onset and the etiology of certain epilepsies. Um, in very, very quickly, the way that we're going to hopefully do this is to use modeling. So for those people who don't know um, about this kind of modeling, um, the idea is that we understand how brain signals that can be acquired non-invasively with things like EEG and MEG are generated by very simple circuits. So I've cartooned this in terms of an excitatory inhibitory uh, couple um, here. And the idea is that you can think of this like a small musical instrument. And that if I ping it with endogenous fluctuations or a stimulus, the note that it um, returns depends upon the synaptic efficacy or the strength of the, um, in this instance, um, intrinsic connections that couple the two populations. So that the stronger the connections or the tighter the strings, the higher the note. Uh, and you can show this mathematically under um, some simplifying assumptions. And interesting, what it paints a picture of is that the the frequency reports the strength of connections and the fluctuations in the frequency, say over peristimulus time here, an illustration of visually evoked gamma, reports the short-term fluctuations in the underlying synaptic efficacy, the, the efficacy or the strength of these effective connections. Um, and we can go further and using more realistic, more elaborate models, we can change the tension on different strings or the efficacy of various intra or interlaminar uh, connections in a cortical microcircuit and look at the notes uh, in terms of the spectral profile that attend these changes we can use those in fact we can richard roche and his colleagues can um, use these systematic changes in the um, the frequencies that are generated by fluctuations in the different um, modeled connections uh, this is an example from um, zebrafish and a model of epilepsy induced by uh, PTZ here. Um, so these are the frequencies down here evolving over time after the introduction of something that causes seizure activity at this point here, the PTZ. These are the actual empirical spectral responses over a long period of time. And these are the ones that are predicted by a model. And then what we can do is we can go back and just look at the slow changes in the strength of the strings of the connectivity that are endogenously fluctuating and then are shifted in parameter space um, by the introduction of this um, of this agent here pushing across the threshold so we can actually measure the slow fluctuations or modulations in synaptic efficacy that underwrite uh, the emergence of seizure activity. So that's the idea. What we hope to do is um, uh, curate comprehensive data sets for inclusions in the eBrains uh, platform, uh, continued development of dynamic causal models and uh, associated pi uh, pipelines, specifically focusing in the first instance on SEG recordings from children with epilepsy. Um, um, that will um, uh, provide uh, curated clinical data sets um, and hopefully start to integrate the maths behind modeling um, into the existing um, 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 modeling uh, um, platforms that exist uh, in eBrains. And I'd just like to close by uh, highlighting uh, um, some of the key people whose work I've been talking about, um, especially uh, Richard, Richard Roche, who's um, helping me in leading this particular work package. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Carl. This was really an exciting talk and we could have many, many, many questions. Uh, and I'm sorry that we can only address uh, one or a few of them. So, so one question uh, is related to an experiment with, with Sherlock Holmes. And you have uh, split, so to say, the audience into two groups, wem women and men, which is quite a binary uh, splitting. So, so can you comment on this? Uh, what, what, so to say, is, is there a lack of alternatives to these two groups? And perhaps related to this, 
I mean, there there are at many points in 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 your in your theory, one could ask, but but why patients are doing it? Let's say in the right way in this uh, under this in this situation and and not in in the other situation. Yeah, why hallucinations uh, come up of a very particular type? while in other uh, aspects of of every uh, uh, of the life uh, the patients seem to be normal so could you mayor, could you perhaps comment on the uh, on the binary versus uh, maybe other models uh, of of splitting um, of of splitting uh, the uh, the perception so the first was yes, uh, I... woman and men so what what are we doing with so to say with with other concepts and how do they reflect how intersubject variability perhaps may reflect yeah uh, that's a great question um i i should apologize i, I didn't mean uh, in spitting people into men and women that men and women were different i was just um trying to illustrate how important it was um for um precision control sorry how action influence decision control so i was just trying to demonstrate i was trying to get half the audience to move their eyes and do their perceptual synthesis and the other half of the audience to do exactly the same perceptual task but without moving their eyes not to illustrate the difference between men and women but to illustrate the difference between uh, yeah. human beings that were moving their eyes and not just to illustrate you know how these synaptic mechanisms can have a really powerful effect on the way that we make sense of the world so that brings us to, to you know to, to i think the, the, the your key question which is you know to what extent does this ability to contextualize and very, very quickly modulate and also slowly modulate synaptic efficacy in the service of encoding precision or uncertainty? To what extent does that um, differ be between individuals? And of course, the story here is that um, the greater the failure of this ability to contextualize and modulate um, the synaptic efficacy that underwrites precision is the spectrum um, that underlies the emergence of many neurological and psychiatric conditions. And, and I include neurology here, you know, you can think of Parkinson's disease as basically a failure to ignore, a failure to ignore sensory evidence that you are not moving at the point you want to initiate a movement. Of course, this is very subpersonal ignoring that may be mediated by a neuromodulator failure that's um, inherits from uh, abnormal dopaminergic mm -hmm. function so in that answer i think is a part answer to your great question which is well why do some people have um, you know if it's broken dopaminergic uh, function you know why do some people get parkinson's disease and other people get schizophrenia and other people get say autism if we lump things like oxy oxytocin into this sort of class of neuromodulatory failures, uh, that's a that's a really important question, which is the you know, which is why we need to develop and phenotype and relate to all the developmental, cultural, um, and anatomical um, factors that would actually explain that difference. So an obvious thing is that the projection fields. Uh, targets of dopamine are very different mm. from serotonergic projections, for example. So that would immediately point you to di two different kinds of synaptopathy, one in the front of the brain due to action, one in the back uh, of the brain due to perception. Mm. Then you've got developmental, you know, when does it hit you? If it hits you young, do you get autism? If it hits you later, do you get schizophrenia? Mm. Um, does it matter, um, you know, what the culture or the, you know, the developmental, the cultural aspects of development? Um, do you get resignation? syndrome uh, or not depending upon you know what your, your your recent experiences so all these are great questions but of course to be able to answer them formally you need to be able to quantify this failure of um, of modulation of synaptic efficacy thank you very much Carl and we received meanwhile many other questions and uh, that's science <laughs> I'm but uh, I'm very sorry that that we have to move forward and and I'm sure that Carl is available to answer also to the questions that we have received a little bit later but we have to move on and uh, come to the uh, next agenda item which hopefully also will raise your interest <laughs>